Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Sustainable House Day expert session on your home. We're very happy that you could join us this evening. Uh, so first, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the lands of many First Nations peoples. I am speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, we would just like to acknowledge that their elders, uh, we would like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And I'd also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who might be watching today. If you like, feel free to share which Aboriginal land you are watching from with us in the chat. Before the webinar begins, I would just like to tell you a little bit more about Sustainable House Day and Renew. Sustainable House Day is a national event that gives you access to Australia's most sustainable homes. This is our final Sustainable House Day event for this year. Uh, as the, part of this year's event, we offered four themed weeks of online and in-person events around the country leading up to Sustainable House Day, which took place on 17th October, when we hosted a day of free online sessions with homeowners. You can now watch recordings of all of these online sessions for free on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Renew Australia. You can also visit sustainablehouseday.com to see detailed house profiles and tour videos for the 130 homes that were open this year. Sustainable House Day is organized by Renew. We're a not-for-profit that inspires, enables, and advocates for people to live sustainably in their homes and communities. You can find out more about us at renew.org.au. Uh, so tonight's session will begin with expert presentations, and then we'll move on to a Q&A session. You can ask questions at any point in the webinar this evening using Zoom's Q&A function, which you can find in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We have several members of the Your Home team who will be answering your questions in the Q&A via text, in addition to uh, in our panel discussion, which will focus on the questions that you submitted with your registration. Uh, we ask that you please do the, use the Q&A and not the chat to ask your questions. Uh, we also have live, live closed captioning for the event. To use it, you can click on live custom live streaming service in the upper left-hand corner of your Zoom window and click view stream to see the automated captioning in a browser window. Uh, so thanks so much. Uh, I would now like to hand over to our MC for this evening, Anna Cumming, who is the editor of Sanctuary. Hello, Anna. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sophie. Welcome to this final session for Sustainable House Day 2021. It's a special event to launch the new edition of Your Home, Australia's award-winning guide to environmentally friendly homes. My name's Anna Cumming and I will be your MC for tonight. I'm speaking today from the traditional country of the Jar Jar Wurrung people in central Victoria, and I acknowledge them as the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. As Sophie said, I'm the editor of Sanctuary Modern Green Homes magazine, our publisher, Renew, is the organiser of Sustainable House Day and has also been part of the various Your Home committees since its beginning 20 years ago. Sanctuary and Your Home have always been complementary publications, pulling in the same direction to inspire interest in sustainable housing and equip readers with the knowledge they need to do it. Personally, I have a long-standing interest in sustainable, energy-efficient and comfortable homes that tread lightly on the earth. And I really love being part of the mission to inspire and educate people about the design strategies, materials and systems available to achieve them, exactly what your home does too. I'm also a huge fan therefore of your home and delighted to see this new overhauled edition complete. We have a great lineup of presentations tonight followed by a Q&A session, so let's get started. First up, we have Angela Newey, manager of the Your Home and Natter's operations team at the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources who will be giving us an, a bit of an introduction to your home and the scope of the new edition. Angela led a committed team to deliver the latest edition of the Your Home book and website, coordinating authors, designers, editors, reviewers, and web developers. With a background in soil carbon, Angela joined the Australian Public Service with a motivation to work on evidence-based policy and programs. She held a variety of positions across subject areas ranging from climate change and biodiversity conservation to energy security before embracing her current role in residential energy efficiency. Hi, Angela, and welcome. Thank you, Anna and, and, and Sophie. And uh, let's see, I'll ask you to start my video. Start my video. Can you see my video? 
Yep, we can see it. Great. Uh, well, thank you. I'll start my. I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, here we go. Uh, all right. Well, um, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie and Anna, and and to renew for the opportunity to speak tonight about our newly released sixth edition of Your Home, Australia's Guide to Environmentally Sustainable Homes. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, what it is, uh, the policy context, and then a, a, some of the key features of the sixth edition. Um, I'm coming to you from Ngunnawal and Gambri land here in Canberra, and I pay my respects to the traditional owners and their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so Your Home is independent, peer-reviewed reference material. Uh, it provides best practice information to build, buy or renovate um, to achieve an environmentally sustainable home. The first edition was released in 2001. So we've just released the sixth edition in, um, in the year of the 20th anniversary of Your Home. The objectives of your home are to increase consumer awareness of the benefits and um, the options for uh, building a sustainable home. Um, your home aims to lift industry capability to um, build energy efficient homes um, for, for sort of dual purposes, uh, both to uh, enable them to deliver increases um, in to deliver against the, the, the increases in minimum energy efficiency requirements uh, in the National Construction Code um, as that gets upgraded, um, but also to help them respond to the increasing demand from consumers for environmentally sustainable homes. Uh, and thirdly, your home supports education, the education sector uh, who train our next generation of uh, industry professionals. Uh, so the policy context of your home, uh, it supports a number of government uh, initiatives. Uh, in the national context, there's the National Energy Productivity Plan, uh, which is a commitment by all Australian governments to improve energy productivity by 40% uh, between 2015 and 2030. There's the trajectory for low energy buildings and the addendum, uh, which again is a commitment by all Australian governments. Uh, and this one is to move our building stock towards zero energy and zero carbon ready buildings. Uh, so that means uh, we're moving towards buildings with um, an efficient thermal shell. So referring to the, the, the roof, the walls, the windows, the floor and how, what materials and how they're designed. So an efficient thermal shell, efficient appliances uh, and buildings that are ready to be hooked up to renewable energy or decarbonised energy. There's also the National Construction Code, which sets minimum energy efficiency requirements for new builds and major renovations. And there's a suite of uh, proposed changes being considered uh, currently for, for that, uh, which do propose upgrades, uh, increases in stringency to the minimum energy efficiency requirements. Uh, and then there's the Nationwide House Energy Rating Scheme, or NATERS, uh, which is a design tool for building energy efficient homes, uh, but is also the most uh, common way uh, that a new building design um, demonstrates that it can uh, ha has achieved the minimum energy efficiency requirements. So Your Home supports all of these initiatives by providing information and guidance on how to go that next step um, to improve the energy efficiency of uh, residential buildings in Australia. So uh, the sixth edition has undergone a major technical and editorial update. Uh, the process was overseen by the Your Home Consultative Committee, which has representatives from industry, from peak housing bodies, from the education sector, from consumer groups and state uh, governments. Uh, and we were also ably uh, assisted by the University of Technology Sid Sydney, who led most of the technical updates. Um, and we'll be hearing from Caitlin McGee about her involvement in the project uh, later this evening. Uh, so we have five new chapters. Uh, they cover passive house, condensation, food and organic waste, 
building with hemp masonry and building for bushfire resilience. And we're also lucky enough to have uh, the author of the Bushfire Resilience chapter, Graham Douglas, here with us tonight too. Uh, we have eight new case studies that uh, show how the theory has been put into practice in real life and include some of the, the, the costs involved. Uh, we have a suite of uh, sort of contemporary images and new technical drawings to illustrate uh, the text. Uh, and both the website and the, and the book have gone, undergone a, a thorough design refresh. Uh, overall, we have over 50 contributing authors, all experts in their field, and every chapter has been peer reviewed. So what it amounts to is a unique compilation of knowledge over the building and design sectors um, for a national audience. So if you're interested in having a copy, uh, you can uh, purchase them from the Your Home website. Um, the, the soft cover versions have been printed now and are being dispatched. The hard cover versions, uh, which we, we're producing as a um, to celebrate the 20th anniversary, uh, we, we're pr producing a small number, a limited edition of the hard cover, um, but they're still being bound. So um, they're expected to be dispatched in, in mid November. Um, and of course, it's all available for free online, as always. So that's really, really it for me. Um, thanks for listening. And uh, back to you, Anna. Thank you, Angela, for that overview. I'm going to get straight on to the next, introducing the next presenters. We're going to hear from the dynamic duo of Caitlin McGee and Dick Clark, both longtime contributing authors to your home. Caitlin's a research director at the Institute for Sustainable Futures at the University of Technology, Sydney. Her research focuses on a regenerative vision for cities as places that make a net positive ecological, social and economic contribution. She's got a particular interest in housing and social change and has been at the forefront of some high profile projects, including a range of training programs for the building industry and, of course, your home. Dick is Principal of Envirotecture and is an accredited building designer with 40 years of experience, focusing exclusively on ecologically sustainable and culturally appropriate buildings. Among many other positions, Dick currently sits on the Australian Sustainable Built Environment Council, or ASBEC, the peak body representing industries committed to a sustainable built environment. Hello, Dick. Hello, Caitlin. Good evening. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Nice to be here. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm coming to you from Gadigal land. Um, and Dick from, maybe you would like to say, Dick? Yeah, <laughs> um, up on Sydney's uh, not quite so sunny northern beaches, which is Guy Mariagal land. Yeah, and we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and um, pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and it is particularly exciting to uh, be doing this because, um, as you heard, um, Dick and I have a long history with your home. We were there right from the very beginning, and it's um, it's, it's how um, we met. Yes, it's how we met. It's how so many things happened. Um, so yeah, it's very exciting for us. Um, so without further ado, I will just share my screen. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yep. Um, and we, what we're going to do is just give you a bit of a tour of the new edition of your home, um, in particular, what's, what's changed and why. And so these are the questions we were, we were asked to address. Um, what we'll focus on mostly is the, the burning question that you all want to know, which is what's new in your home. But we'll try to cover some of these other um, things as well. So we, we thought we would start um, by thinking about well, what's changed since the last edition, which was released in 2013? So, well, in terms of the bigger picture, um, I won't dwell too much on this because it's all around us at the moment with the Glasgow Summit, but I guess never, I've been all at all the launches for your home, um, involved with all the editions, but never has there been this kind of imperative and this urgency. So we're actually seeing and feeling the effects of climate change now. Um, the events of the past few years have really 
brought that home. Um, and um, the science is even clearer. So we know that um, at the moment, we, we are at about 1.1 degrees of warming. We're already seeing um, very destructive impacts around the world. 1.5 degrees of warming is generally agreed at the point as the point at which the impacts go from destructive to catastrophic. Um, and so the Paris Agreement is aimed at um, keeping um, global average temperatures close to 1.5 degrees of warming and well under two is their wording. But we know that um, if we are going to do that, we actually have to make deep cuts this decade. So that's kind of scary. Um, so what they mean by that is we're going to have to reduce emissions by about half from 2020, 2010 levels this decade. So yes, that's definitely um, really scary, but I'm an eternal optimist. And I think also what's changed is that there is so much more momentum now and so much more understanding. And um, there is there seems to me that there's a real will to do this and there's a lot of innovation happening in the building sector and um, it's around climate change but it's not limited to climate change so there are other approaches coming to the fore like circular economy regenerative design so uh, it's both frightening and um, you know I think there's um, a lot to be excited about too if you're involved in housing so next slide oops no, that's right. Sorry, Dick. I just stole your thunder there. Whoa. It's gone. It's gone it's, it's, it's it's off on yet. process of a time. So um, what, what's uh, whoa. <laughs> the technology's run Sorry, away with it? Yes, there's just a delay in the, okay, we're good now. <laughs> yeah, so what, what's happening next year in terms of uh, regulation? And, and regulation exists to... Um, put a, a bar under worst possible performance. So simply being compliant with regulation is not anything more than just not breaking the law effectively. So next year, the National Housing, uh, the National Construction Code in volume two, which covers housing, uh, is increasing the stringency in a number of areas. And importantly, it's bringing in some effective condensation provisions which really do mean that when it lifts the thermal performance from six, the current six stars to seven, it will be an effective lift because six stars was always a bit notional when there was no control over uh, condensation and so on. So that's, that's a good thing, but it's still, you know, only uh, just minimum compliance. Uh, it's also bringing some new stuff, the uh, whole of home annual energy use requirements. That's brand new in the, the, at the codified level. In New South Wales, Basics has done that for some years and we'll still cover it uh, in, in that state. Also, in uh, Class 2 buildings, and this includes not just the, the larger multi-residential buildings, but uh, quite a few smaller uh, residential buildings that uh, are not side-by-side um, -side dual occupancies that, you know, where there's one above the other, they're a Class 2 building and there are new uh, rules and regulations around that. Okay, that's minimum compliance. On the next slide, um, we can see when the technology catches up with us. There we go. So uh, Angela mentioned before the trajectory, which has been agreed to by all of the building and planning ministers around the country through COAG. And, and so what we're trying to do is steer the world towards a, a zero net energy future. And in the next slide, the part that's relevant to the National Construction Code is, is that bit boxed in red. But once again, it's really saying, look, this is what we have to achieve as a minimum. Nothing should fall between the cracks here or fall below the line. What your home does is say, yeah, that's great, but it's not best practice. In your home, we have best practice. This is where we can aim to get ahead of the curve and meet or beat the, the timeline, the trajectory to net zero. And this is why your home is so important as a, uh, a, a carriage of information, a presenter of information in a highly detailed set of uh, fact sheets that are very, very practically applicable. Um, so what's changed? Uh, Angela ran through a couple of these before, but it's 
essentially it's about best practice that meets or exceeds the minimum standards and the trajectory. So what we're trying to do is get to this kind of net zero position and it's not just net zero on energy or carbon, but really net zero ecological impact. And your home, uh, for those of you who are familiar with it already, would know that it's a very broad based uh, document. There are lots of different um, pieces of the puzzle that are covered. And in the 71 new chapters, there are lots of tweaks and, and lots of new content. Uh, I won't read through that list. We might jump to the next one in the interest of time. Start going through the things that are um, updated. I think, Caitlin, would you like to speak to this one? Yeah, so um, we've just pulled out, um, there have been a lot of updates, but we've just pulled out some of the, the key updates that are really relevant today. So. Um, and we'll just go through and explain a little bit about what's changed. So the adapting to climate change um, chapter has had a very comprehensive update. So all the latest data is there, um, including links to go and understand what the in projected impacts are for your particular location. Um, there's also a lot of content there about um, what the different impacts are and how you can design to mitigate them so that you're able to kind of tailor your strategies for your location. Um, we did have a particular focus on um, uh, updating the content on heat waves and you know, different ways to um, you know, deal with that. So the, the concept of cool rooms is one example um, and also very important um, bushfires. We've got a whole new sheet um, chapter on that, which um, Graham is gonna talk about later. Um, zero energy and zero carbon homes. So somebody pre-submitted a question and, and thank you very much, by the way, all of you who did that, um, asking about, um, you know, talking about the imperative to um, really reduce our emissions from our homes and what's the most sort of co cost-effective or smartest way to go about that. So that is really the focus of this sheet, um, talking about how you might strategize to do that most cost-effectively. Um, that sheet is focused on um, emissions from the operational energy use of your home, but we also have a new sheet or an updated sheet on embodied energy and embodied carbon, which looks at the impacts of building materials. Um, so that one's also pretty important. Um, and another important aspect of the zero energy home, um, increasingly important is, is battery storage, which leads into the next slide. Um, so this is another sheet that had a really significant update because the technology is really improving. And even though batteries um, are quite expensive, um, um, more people are um, utilising them because um, the costs are coming down. Um, and also if you have a um, photovoltaic system, um, I guess what's changed since 2013 is the feed-in tariffs are way less generous and peak electricity prices are higher. So batteries start to make a lot more economic sense in, in this scenario. So this, um, this chapter really talks about what are the different types of batteries? What are the key specifications you need to think about? Um, has really useful links to a calculator that can help you um, size your batteries for your PV system and you know based on your um, energy demand and calculate the kind of payback um, it also takes you through the various configurations for electrical connection. Um, and there are a whole lot of other um, topics that it covers too, including safe disposal and recycling of batteries, which is an emerging area. Um, and there's gonna need to be a lot of growth in that area. So that's a space to watch. Um, solar, I won't say too much about this one. Um, I guess it's not so much about adding content, but just a comprehensive update of all the text and the references. Um, I guess since 2013, as I talked about, the financial considerations are a bit different in terms of the incentive structures. So costs have come down, but the feeding tariffs are lower. Um, there also is, I guess, because household solar is so popular now, we also added a bit of content on avoiding sharks because um, you know that has been a bit of a problem that because a lot of people are getting solar, um, there are some dodgy deals out there and if something looks too good to be true, it may well be. Um, so there is some advice and some links on, you know, making sure that um, you, you, you know, um, your system's got the right accreditation and you're dealing with an accredited professional. Um, also, um, some other areas, connected homes. So connected home technology has advanced so much since 2013. 
Um, it's become really accessible. You can buy smart devices. You can control them on your phone. A lot more people have smart meters as well that their um, electricity retailer might have installed. So this section really covers um, how you might use connected home devices to um, manage your energy use and, and reduce your bills. And electric vehicles, also a big one. Um, they're expected to reach price parity in Australia this decade. Um, uptake is still fairly low, but it's really starting to shift. Um, so it talks about, we talk about the different types of electric vehicles, the ranges, um, all the charging considerations, um, what you would need to know if you wanted to make your home EV ready for, for charging a vehicle in future. And Dick, um, would you like to go through the updates to the materials section? Yeah, so materials has had um, a, a nice rework. You know, some new chapters and, and also um, pretty much every chapter's uh, been revised and updated. There's a great chapter on hemp masonry. Um, so this is the, the material that combines hemp fibre, lime and sand, uh, hemp lime composite. Um, which is great insulation, very robust and resilient, great for farmers and soil, and is a net carbon sink. So there's a, a good chapter there. Sediment control is an old one that's been in there from the beginning, um, but it's interesting how the need for that uh, is still ongoing to prevent pollutants, um, wash away, et cetera, uh, washouts from entering waterways. And on the next slide, Um, the the waste sec sorry the materials section uh, has all of these chapter headings in it, and uh, the ones that have probably been updated the most are uh, concrete slab floors. Looking at how to insulate that um, and and tech, you know specific techniques in in how to do that. Um, in waste minimization, I should have um, said that first. I started halfway down. That's a bit silly. But waste, waste minimization, I was actually witness to a, um, uh, a bad example of that today on a demolition site. Embodied energy, this is now, it's going to be the next big thing for sure. Uh, it's already been considered uh, in a regulatory level by various state governments and wrestling with how to do it. It's, it's a, a wicked problem in many ways, but it's one that we have to, to come to grips with. And your home's got some great information to help steer us as we make those decisions. And green roofs and walls, increasingly popular. Uh, so there's some really good information there as well. So these are photos that I took this morning with my little drone of a, uh, <laughs> a demolition of how not to do it. Um, construction waste makes up about 40% of, uh, of all waste going to landfill. And it's really important that we find ways to deconstruct rather than demolish. Uh, so that's just a, you know, a real world timely example. Okay. And look, I think, I think we're at time. So um, what we'll say about this section is um, if you want to know how we got involved in the, your home journey, um, look no further than the next edition of Sanctuary. We've written um, an, an article about the backstory, which we hope you'll really enjoy. Um, we enjoyed writing it. Uh, benefits of your home. I, I think it's clear we both think it's awesome. <laughs> um, I've used it in my renovation. Um, and I think if we could give you one piece of advice, I believe we're going to get a chance to do that in the panel discussion. So we, we might leave that for now and um, sign off and um, we'll be back in the panel discussion. Thank you very much to the two of you. Um, and you beat me to the uh, getting a plug in for your article in the next issue of Sanctuary. <laughs> um, it's going to be out in late November. Um, so anybody who's listening who might like to read that article, you will be able to buy a copy from your local news agent from late November or go to the sanctuary.renew.org.au website to buy your own from start early November. Thanks, Dick and Caitlin. Now we're going to move straight on to our next presentation. Uh, Dr. Graham Douglas, another Your Home contributing author and also lecture, lecturer in bushfire protection at the University of Western Sydney. Graham worked with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service in the area of community safety for more than 15 years and was responsible for developing the legislative provisions and policy relating to bushfire risk management planning, development control for bushfire prone areas, 
and environmental impact of hazard, hazard reduction activities. He participated in a number of subcommittees working on the review of the Australian standard for construction in bushfire prone areas. And he has a PhD in bushfire protection and climate change and has published widely on planning and development control in bushfire prone environments. That's the spiel. Hello, Graham. We've gone straight to your presentation, Graham. <laughs> now we can't hear you at this stage. You need to unmute yourself. There we are. How's that? There we are. Great. I can hear you now. Take it away. Thank you. Just, just those delays. Well, thank you very much for having me here tonight. And I'm on Gumbangia country on the north coast of New South Wales, mid-north coast. And um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our traditional owners, past, present and emerging, and also recognise the land is and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, the discussion on bushfire protection that I want to talk about today, and uh, particularly as it's related to your home, is to give a little bit of a background and just a taste of some of the things that you can find in the document. So one of the things that I would like to, first of all, is people um, will find in the document a little bit of an understanding about what do we mean by bushfires. Um, bushfires and bushfire intensity, which is a measure of bushfire behaviour, arises essentially from vegetation, the different types of vegetation, their geography and actually their elevation, um, the slopes under which the fires burn because increasing slopes will increase the rate of spread of fires and clearly fire weather, including season and the location of where you are in the landscape. And many of you will be aware of this meter that's on the side of the road. And this is uh, an indicator of some of the fire danger conditions and being aware of the fire danger conditions is a really important element of living in our Australian bush. Now, there's typically a fire that's occurring somewhere in Australia on any particular day. And fire seasons actually shift uh, across the continent where in the north of the continent we have our winter and, and early spring bushfire seasons, and in the south, including southwestern Western Australia, Adelaide, uh, around uh, parts of Victoria and Tasmania, we tend to get a more summer and early water, autumn fire season. So fire seasons migrate and shift across Australia. And the important thing about bushfires is their elements in terms of bushfire attack. And one of the things that we need to think about when we're building in bushfire prone areas is the nature of the bushfire attack and how it impacts on the building and what we're trying to do to actually resolve those problems. So I put this into what I've referred to as primary bushfire attack, which includes flame contact if you're very close to the bushland, radiant heat, embers, which are very common a way of houses being lost, wind, and of course, smoke penetration. And secondary bushfire attack mechanisms are things where we have a primary attack then causing an impact on another sort of um, area. And house to house fires is one example of that. The accumulation of debris and then their ignition close to the house falling limbs and wind-driven uh, materials uh, through the fires uh, and the winds that fires cause. And then, of course, landscaping and furnishings that you find within uh, uh, an area or around the house. And this is just an example of what embers look like, which is one of the major mechani mechanisms for the house losses of houses. And in this case, embers penetrate the fabric of the building and then burn from the inside out not so much from the outside in. One of the things you'll often hear in the area of building in bushfire prone areas is this term bowel, which is referred to as a bushfire attack level. And the bowel actually dictates what the standards will say you need to achieve in relation to the construction requirements for particular buildings. And here we're talking about residential homes, but it also applies to class two homes and class three homes, and in New South Wales, class nine homes as well, and in Victoria. So typically, these bowels are applied at distances of between 100 and 150 metres. 
and the closer you are to the um, actual edge of the fire will depend on what the construction levels are that apply. Some of the things that we can also look at is design and some of the design issues are about stopping debris and materials accumulating in tricky areas so that we can actually improve the design of buildings. Now, these are very simplistic concepts, and I'm not suggesting at all that you um, would apply these in all circumstances, but they give you a concept and an idea of how to actually think about design in the broader sense. So these, these are just examples of things that can be done to achieve it. Um, but obviously, um, the building has to fit within the context of its site. And there are a number of very specific issues. Because embers are such a, a, an important element um, of house loss and, and penetration into the building, we often need to make sure that we do things that actually stop embers from penetrating into the building. And so... We can use fly screen materials around the building at windows so that they reduce the number of embers penetrating through towards the glazing. They also help reduce heat on those glazing elements. We can protect our subfloor areas from embers through the use of, of sarking. And these photos are showing us two other mechanisms. One is we in integrate um, gutter guards and valley guard systems to stop the debris accumulating in gutters and then causing a fire under the roofing system. And in very high exposure areas, we can use shutters, bushfire shutters, that will actually prevent radiant heat, breaking windows and causing uh, fires to start inside the building. And one of the things that are re is really important when we're thinking about bushfires and designing and planning for bushfire is making sure we give access to firefighters so they can actually get to the building, actually provide support and actually help protect buildings because there are always going to be conditions where buildings need to be protected and providing access for firefighters, providing water supplies, making sure that the building is clear and tidy around the property will always help in terms of survival of a building. And our landscaping. Now, preparing for bushfires through landscaping is a very important element and the nature and types of vegetation that can be used in our landscaping can all lead to either bringing the fire towards the home or in fact, helping shield the building and actually helping reduce the impact that bushfires have and indeed maybe filtering embers. So landscaping is a very crucial element. And of course, if we have a bushfire, we need to have a bushfire survival plan. And people should be talking to their fire services in their state, particularly their rural or country fire services, and actually starting to prepare for bushfire survival plans. And now is the time to do that if you're living in a bushfire prone environment. So it's very important to work out what your strategies are, how you're going to deal with a bushfire event and making sure that you can survive those. Thank you very much. That's all I wanted to talk about today. And I'm happy to answer questions later on if we get to them. Thank you, Graham. That last photo in your presentation is quite striking, isn't it? <laughs> okay, our final presenter tonight is Luke Middleton of EME Design, who designed and built his own comfortable family home in Northcote in Melbourne. Luke's home is featured on the front cover of the new Your Home book and is included inside as a case study. Luke is proud to showcase the passive solar design and passive house features he used when designing his home built on the existing foundations left from the previous dwelling. The 7.9 star Natas rated home features rammed earth walls for thermal mass, clever glazing and orientation, energy efficient appliances and energy generation. Hi Luke. Hi Anna, thank you. Hello everyone. Um, hope everyone's uh, enjoying the spring weather. I uh, first acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Look, um, I'm going to have, I've got quite a bit to go through today, uh, and I'm going to start uh, by sharing the screen. So let me just get on with that, and then we can. Your home is um, 
an amazing, uh, amazing publication. And um, before I get into your home, I think what I wanted to sort of touch on is that obviously resilient architecture is going to be a vital component of the planet's sustainable future. And sustainability involves multiple layers of interlinked aspects that should be embedded in the design process from the beginning. And I, we find your home a fantastic reference for a wide audience. It covers all the aspects really well. And it's really good to use because it allows you to understand that there's a lot of interlinked and very important interrelationships between these things. And for that reason, I have this DNA up on the slide as I think that DNA, uh, having a, 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 a design start with the right DNA is vital. And um, your home, if you use your home, you're very unlikely to design something like this, which obviously is, um, I suppose, uh, a, a modernist building, which has been covered in green. So without further ado, I'll talk a little bit about a couple of the questions that were sent in. Um, some people asked a couple of questions in relation to what are the key things you might do when you first start? And this will relate also to our, my case study. Um, understanding your context, I think that's really important, understanding the orientation, the existing vegetation, the potential access to winter sun, looking at your neighbours and how their buildings interrelate with your site and looking at what the future might be, look at the scale of the design and development in the area. But another really important thing is, you know, do you like the neighbourhood? Do you like the street? And, and what are the amenities? And, or what are the future amenities? And then if you sort of take the next steps, then one needs to establish key priorities, desired outcomes. And I think that's really important to look at these at three levels. One is now, how do you use the spaces? How can you make things multifunctional, therefore build less? How do you look at the seasons and work with the seasons? And how can the architecture and landscape work as a team? Um, then you've got to look at, well, what, what happens in 15 years time where it, circumstances might have changed? And then taking it another step, what happens in 50 plus years? Because sustainability is about resilience as well. It's a very big responsibility when you start to build a building, you're putting a lot of energy into making a structure that will last a long time. And that's an, I get to this point, which is what we really need to deal with is the fact that uh, many people think the impact of architecture is about aesthetics. This is a quote that I've taken and adapted from Renzo Piano. Uh, and um, unfortunately he takes this point of view, which is obviously that it's all about um, the aesthetics. However, we believe you should reword that. And it's really important that it's a very dangerous job because if you make the wrong decisions, you're imposing an energy intensive and fragile built environment for more than hundred years. So now I'll move into the case study. This was the existing site. Um, here's the existing building. Now we managed to recycle quite a lot of it. We did an analyze the building, but unfortunately uh, this building uh, was, whilst it sort of had good intentions and had Northern glazing and the like, the um, analysis showed that it didn't actually have, um, wasn't going to be able to be remodeled as well. So what did we do? We looked at op optimizing the solar, enhancing the heritage context, um, dealing with the embodied energy of the existing by recycling the foundations, sourcing local materials, the new buildings made with very, very low carbon build uh, materials, a flexible floor plan, productive gardens, and most importantly, delightful spaces to live in that are comfortable. So if we look at the existing home, you'll see this section illustrates the problem. This is the house to the north and that house uh, is overshadowing all of the northern windows to this lovely northern orientated um, windows that ran all the way along the northern aspect of the existing house. So when you look at the shadows, again, this is again about this observation, which is a permaculture principle, what we, thought, we find is essential for good sustainable design. You can see these deep shadows, the whole site is overshadowed by, even though it's a single story, it's a tall building and it's on the slight uphill side. So what did we do? We said, well, let's get that existing slab. Let's get those existing foundations. Let's recycle the shed to the neighbor. Let's take the roof off and give it to a farmer. So he used it for, we gave away the solar panels to series. The, the kitchen was recycled. We, we did what we could. We separated materials. Um, and then we designed a new building to sit over that. 
and we managed to look at the way the storm water the old building had concrete a lot of concrete the whole new landscape is completely permeable we added um, 11,000 litres of water storage under the deck we had to analyze the existing root depth of the existing gum tree to make sure that we could keep that gum tree and not disturb its roots so we we, we worked out the structure of the water uh, the, the deck to work around the water tanks again starting with the premise of sustainability from day one um, so here also looking at design for the future, how can this be flexible in the future? How do the zones or the spaces work? And here's the ground floor plan. I'm not going to go in detail about the planning, but to, to suffice to say, we've centralised the services to make sure that there's minimal service runs. We've allowed lots of flexibility within these rooms and a lot of non-load bearing walls to allow for flexibility down the track. Upstairs, again, this flexibility of zoning or not zoning, um, there's doorways built into walls that can be in implemented down the track. Uh, here's a section of the building. The carport doubles as a, as a sort of um, play space because we may not need a car. Um, and we don't really use it much now, uh, but you may need it to charge your electric car. Here's the water tanks, here's the green roof on the bungalow down the track. Here's a solar analysis of how we looked at how is the sun going to hit the rammed earth walls in the future to make sure that we optimise the sun. So the shape of the windows, the position of the windows is designed for views, for sun and for um, also cross ventilation. So I'm going to just skip through these because there's quite a lot to go through, but there's cross ventilation. This building has been designed using both passive solar and uh, solar um, passive house principles. Here's the, the, the foundations. I had to take particular care to make sure the demolition guy didn't take everything up. Um, and uh, here's the slab that we recycled. Here are the boulders that we recycled. There's a lot of floaters in our region of um, Northcote. Uh, here's the rammed earth walls. Again, lower embodied energy um, form of a thermal mass. And here's the structure going up. Um, so the build, these walls were in, encapsulated in an insulated shell. And um, here's the structure. So here, these are the northern windows. So we had to use nor high northern windows to capture the sun. We did the analysis. It just said there's no point putting windows along this edge. You need to lift them up to optimise your solar gain. Uh, here's a courtyard. Again, we had to step back in to get the sun through here. Oh, sorry, skipping through. Uh, extensive insulation done very thoroughly. Um, this is the building wrap that provides the internal layer that gives you the air tightness for the passive uh, for the passive house principles. Here's the rammed earth getting connected to the wrap. Here's the uh, ventilation system. So this is the this is the system that brings in the fresh air 24/7 into our home when the home is at 20 degrees uh, at night time without heating. It will only drop a couple of degrees overnight and the two degree air will get preheated and brought into the home, 100% fresh air, preheated to almost within half a degree of the internal temperature, which is fantastic through a heat recovery system. Here's more wrap photos. Here's the building from the back. And here's our pressure test. So here we are in anticipation, we pressurized the building. We had to do a, quite a bit of um, work. I was actually, um, not a passive certified designer at the time, um, so it was a little bit um, a little bit blind leading the blind, but we did it did our best and we we managed to get to the 0.6 air changes. A key component, I believe, of sustainable future for architecture is testing and monitoring. Here are the thermal imagery that we've been taking. This actually shows we can see these little blue lines. They are the thermal bridging of the spaces that you get with your double glazing in Australia. Not many uh, companies offer warm edge spaces, unfortunately. Here's the winter performance. So this is the outdoor temperature. You can see hovering very low. Here's the indoor temperature without heating. Here's the indoor temperature. That is a slight bit of heating on at that point, but you can see here, um, that some spaces were dropping a little bit lower, uh, but generally speaking, the temperatures, even when it was down at about one degree, we're still maintaining 18 in the main living spaces. Uh, again, more monitoring. Here's a picture of the building. Um, and this is from that courtyard, the middle courtyard. 
is an iron bark. Now this iron bark is part of the, the long-term strategy. We are looking east from the west. This, we, these windows have inter blinds built in to stop the um, a massive amount of heat from the Western sun. And um, so this will become a shade element in the future. These are the results. I'm not gonna go into detail, but basically the, bo the bottom line is this building's very net energy positive. So we actually run export on average nine kilowatts per day over the whole year. So in summer, we're probably exporting upwards of 30 kilowatts uh, with a five kilowatt system, not a big system. So I'm just quickly flick through these. What still needs to be done? Well, obviously we just believe we're just a stepping stone. All buildings should be as good as ours or better. Um, if we do compare this idea of uh, what um, uh, Dick was talking about, the idea that we need to be way beyond minimum, here is a seven star house modeled under passive house. Um, it would require 15 kilowatts of energy if you take into account the thermal bridges and things allowed by a standard seven star house. Whereas the MM house actually only needs 2.9 kilowatts of solar to provide it become energy neutral. Um, so I won't go through that too much. This is the passive house principles. What is the problem? Lack of a little bit of understanding. And this is my last point that I'll be making, which is that cars get manufactured prototype tested and then they go to market. Everyone that's a professional gets tested. Housing gets built and then it's called a sustainable project. The missing link is the testing. So what do we need to do? We need to have verifiable calibrated testing, I think in the future. I think that the, your home is a, is a really good stepping stone in that respect, because it allows people to be armed with the right tools and for, for the punters and, the, and students to understand what goes into embedded sustainability. Um, and we believe that all projects should be have to, all high profile projects should be uh, obliged to publish their results. This will make a substantial change, just like Dick was talking about. We need um, a quantum shift. Here's a few photos just to finish off on. This is uh, that Sustainable House Day a few years ago when we could all talk to people in person. Um, thank you. Thank you, Luke. Sorry for racing through that. That was no, it was quick, a bit wasn't telegraphic, it? but no, not to worry. Thanks for uh, thanks for um, whizzing us through that. Uh, we are running slightly behind time, but not to worry. Uh, so thank you everybody for those very informative presentations. Now we'll get stuck into our Q&A session. So if you would all like to turn your cameras on panellists, that would be great. We have lots of questions submitted by you, our viewers, when you registered. Uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, we also have a small army of your home team members behind the scenes who will be answering your questions via Zoom's Q&A feature. So keep your eye on that too. And I believe that you can see the questions and answers that other people submit as well. So um, some great questions that have come in have been answered already via using that, that technique. So we may not cover them live, but um, yeah, please do dig into the Q&A answered questions and keep sending through your new ones. So what are, the, here's the first question, just uh, to get us all going. What are the most cost-effective ways to improve energy efficiency and sustainability in your home? Not a, um, not a small one. We'd like to get started. With this. Oh, I, I'll have a quick go at that. Um, there, there are so many kind of low-hanging fruit opportunities that, that you can lock in. So a lot relate to um, passive design, um, you know, some of the principles Luke was talking about. Um, Good orientation is often free, um, where you locate glazing, how much, um, all of this sets up the structure for how your house performs and it's it's so important. Um, other opportunities like um, water efficient shower heads, you know, that can actually really significantly impact on your hot water use and therefore your energy use. So there are a whole lot of things that are really simple and cheap that just should be locked in and and your home is a good resource for kind of working out what those things are efficient appliances is another is another um and also um looking at materials so there are so many kind of ecologically better or preferred materials that don't cost any extra um 
I mean, one big example, um, low carbon concrete, um, you know, it depends where you live, but often you can get that for the same cost as the regular product. So um, yeah, I'm sure others have things to add as well, but that's my two cents worth. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'd probably add to that that a lot, I mean, if you're building, it's different if you're renovating or building new, but in all cases, I think that um, being clever with the floor plan, you can build less and build it well. Um, you can, uh, yeah, look at what you can uh, recycle and look at the long-term effect of recycling versus getting it perfect if you rebuild. So that that's always a really tricky one, renovate, or I mean, it's, it's sometimes it's made decisions made by the heritage advisors. But um, yeah, I think that uh, I, I would say that clearly you we should be building probably smaller um, and also thinking about how the landscape interacts because a lot of buildings forget that they might overshadow a landscape, which then the landscape becomes less productive. So when you're analysing a site, it should be not just about getting the sun into the building, it should be about sun into the landscape, because ultimately we know that if we can reduce the food miles and we can produce even just a um, small amount of food on, on our each residential plot, it makes a big difference because, you know, cart us, carting lettuces around, does it really make sense? It's not fresh um, and it's a lot of embodied energy. Anybody else want to jump in on that question before we move to the next one? Yeah, I, I might, Anna. Um, just to just to point out that in um, in your home, in the affordability um, section um, in the chapter, there's a, a good uh, study uh, cited from by Sustainability Victoria, and it goes through a, a number of different upgrade measures. You know, starting from um, a low flow shower he shower head. And it has, you know, the average cost of different measures and then the average payback period. And, it, you know, it goes through a range of different things like ceiling insulation, efficient lighting, um, efficient heating, draft ceiling, efficient washing machine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I, I jump, jump into the Your Home uh, website and uh, look at the affordability section uh, to see some cost effective ways to improve energy efficiency. Absolutely. And uh, I might just also suggest that quite a lot of sustainable designers, um, they, they can be used not just to design a house, but as consultants for um, well, many uh, will act as a, uh, as a consultant to assess an existing house and to help you with, um, with, with what steps might, might be most cost effective to increase your, the, the energy efficiency of your home by you know, as much as possible. We actually have an article in the current issue of Sanctuary, Sanctuary 56, um, which is a case study of a project that, um, that did exactly that. So readers, um, viewers might be interested to, to read that. So getting on to the next question, somebody has asked, does the book cover how to go about going all electric and putting solar on an existing house? How much might it cost, where to start and so forth? And there's a, another question that would, would tie in with this which is how does the concept of a zero carbon home relying on renewable energy work with people whose homes are not suitable for solar installation? So how do you do it? And what, what do you do if you can't do it? Um, I'll make the point that, um, yeah, I mean, it's a really good point about homes that aren't suitable for solar. And, um, you know, a lot of apartments could be in that um, bucket as well because it's a lot more complex. Um, so the, the zero carbon um, sheet does, um, the chapter does talk about that. And, and the key is really like um, reducing your um, energy use. And then you can think about other options like green power. Um, and that, I mean, that, that is still really important. So, you know, we really recognize that not everybody has um, the opportunity to install solar, um, but there are other ways to to kind of um, deal with that. And um, uh, yeah, I think um, the, the zero energy, zero carbon chapter is, is a, in your home is a key resource there. Um, I suppose I, I, I could try and answer the first bit. We, we have a policy of specifying um, electrical appliances and, and specifying out gas uh, because it's pretty much impossible to have zero emissions if you have gas on a property. Um, 
and there are more than enough options for all electric in terms of cooking and, and hot water and so on. And often a building may not have the amount of solar access for um, passive solar that we would like, but often the roof does and you can borrow some of that solar energy from the roof and use some smart technologies like hydronic heating to, uh, to bring that into the house. Um, but where there is just no solar access and some years ago, uh, CEDA, the government agency in New South Wales did some mapping of solar access and found that there are about a third of sites in New South Wales that were unsuitable for rooftop PV. And I, I'm thinking that might vary around the country. Um, the flatter cities would have a higher proportion, but yeah, there's always going to be some. And you just have to say, well, if until the grid goes totally green, we'll just select um, electricity from the grid that is green. And I know there's certainly plenty of tips in your home on um, energy efficiency, so reducing the amount of power that you need, the of electricity that you need in the first place, uh, which is a great way to get around the problem <laughs> before you even encounter it. Would anybody else like to comment on that? Well, going all electric, adding solar question? Are we done? Okay. How has your home incorporated locally specific design and building information with respect to you know, the fact that climates vary around Australia? I know um, this was touched on a little bit in the presentations, but it'd be great to hear a little bit more. Um, um, I don't want to hog this, but <laughs> yeah, this is something we, we had to really consider because it's very easy for a, uh, a publication or a, an information source to become Southeast Australian centric. And, uh, and, and there's great danger in that, that it, it leaves people disenfranchised in, in <laughs> swathes of ignorance in other parts of the country and you know, subject to who knows what information. So it was very important that the, the, uh, the information was crafted and tailored to cover the whole country. Um, and there are a number of specific techniques, for instance, dealing with condensation in walls in Melbourne is pretty much the reverse of what you do in Darwin. And so all of those kinds of details had to be tailored. And so, you know, I'd encourage people that are in the top end or Broome or, um, you know, Alice Springs, Mount Isa, wherever, um, not to assume, as many people do, that it's just oh, another Sydney, Melbourne thing. What would they know? Uh, that's not the case. There are a number of people that have contributed to this who are well experienced in, um, you know, the, the hot, arid and, and the hot uh, tropical climates and, and it's been tailored to suit. Yeah, I'd um, just add to that to um, have a look at the design for climate um, sheet, which is in the um, passive design section, which kind of gives an overview of what, what the key strategies might be um, different um, climates and also to reiterate what Dick said, one of the specific instructions for the update coming from the Your Home Consultative Committee was to actually make sure that this spoke more to those kind of northern locations um, so that it really is a guide for the whole of Australia. Yeah. Angela, would you like to talk a little bit about the design for place house plans that are included in Your Home? Sure, yeah. So we have um, we have a suite of free uh, house designs that um, are available on our on our website to download um, called design for place um, so they have all been architecturally designed to um, so there's sort of three three main styles uh, for, for different size houses um, and they've been for, for each design they've been uh, rated to achieve at least seven stars in um, I think it's the eight different climate zones across Australia um, and the, the pack for a particular climate zone will have modifications to that design that are appropriate to get the seven stars in that climate. Um, so they're a really, really good resource. Um, we, we do have two case studies on our, our website that are builds that have used design for place plans. And there are case studies that uh, cover the, the breadth of Australia in all eight climate zones across Australia. 
Thank you, that's great. I think the design for place plans are a fantastic resource too. Next question is probably for you, Graham. What, what are the main things I need to know to build in a bushfire prone area for, bush, for both bushfire resilience and also making sure my house is energy efficient and sustainable? How can I do both? Yeah, that's a very good question. And comments have been made by Dick and Caitlin already. And I think uh, the, the importance is that many of the energy efficiency requirements are also going to work for us for bushfire. So a good example is the extent to which we can reduce, um, you know, breezes that are, you know, pushing directly under doors and gaps and things like that. Working on some of those things and actually improving those areas will actually stop embers penetrating into the into the house. Now, you can also, where you do need ventilation, you can use the fly screen materials and keep the gaps quite narrow. So it's not like you don't, where you need to have flow, you can you have to have no flow. But ember protection is actually achieved where we can keep the gaps very small, where they are uh, maintained and, and actually protected. And um, importance of good sarking and good insulating materials um, and, and working through those issues of making sure you don't get the condensation, uh, but also making sure that you you protect the the fabric and the external uh, part of the building and stop embers penetrating. Embers represent about 80% of house losses. The closer you get to the bush, though, the more intense the protection measures have to be. And that's when the costs start to go up and also where we actually have to um, put in tighter and tighter requirements. So um, that that's a very they're they're quite you know work together in many cases. Um, sometimes the challenge of a north face is an issue, um, but even then we can work around those issues of making sure that we get passive solar into the home that's necessary, and at the same time using materials that protect us from bushfire. Great, um, Dick actually wrote an article for Sanctuary. I forget how many issues ago three or four issues ago on um, designing exactly what we've just been talking about, Grant, what you've just been talking about, designing for both bushfire safety and, um, and energy efficiency and sustainability. So I encourage people to go hunting for that if they're interested in further information on that topic. One interesting thing about uh, bushfires and I suppose air quality is that the passive home or passive house brings its air in through the heat recovery system, which can actually be upgraded with a high-end filter that um, will um, purify the air to a great degree. Um, and obviously a passive house is also very um, airtight already and less likely to have the cracks for the for the ember attack. But um, I, I, I'm not gonna step on Graham, uh, Graham's area there but yeah in, in general i think you know when you have all that smoke fallout in the city we actually um were quite lucky in that the air quality inside the house was better than the air quality outside mm. yeah i think luke's right i think we need to to recognize that these things aren't always in opposition to each other that they can be complementary um and that yeah it's really and bushfire protection measures in general are passive in nature as well so they're not, you know, we're not using very expensive active systems to drive bushfire protection. Um, we try to use passive systems and getting them right in conjunction with good air quality, good energy efficiency, um, condensation control can all, all work as long as it's carefully planned for. Absolutely. Well, thanks for your comment, Luke. That leads me neatly into my next question from one of our viewers. Which, is the, which goes as follows. Is the German passive house standard suitable for Australian conditions? Are the passive house design principles better suited to cold climates and are Australian passive houses therefore more likely to be faced with the problem of removing excess heat? Uh, well, I think uh, I'll uh, answer part of that and maybe let Dick answer the other part. So in terms of uh, passive house, I, I live in a, a house which is effectively running on a passive house system. However, we have designed it for this Melbourne climate to actually still have purging like you would have with a passive solar house. So I think that the two need to work in conjunction. 
Passive House is based on science and therefore it can work in all environments, but there is a requirement to remove humidity in the uh, other climates. But I might hand over to Dick on that because I think he's probably more of an expert than me. Um, well, I don't know about that, but we've, we've, um, we've got a bit of experience having four um, certified passive houses and, and several more under construction. And, and what we've found is that um, the, well, the, the, the physics is quite simple. Heat flows in, heat flows out. And if you're trying to maintain an interior with a comfortable temperature and, and the external temperature is either too high or too low, if you've got an official thermal envelope, it'll do the same job. There might be subtle differences, but, but essentially uh, it's just about controlling the heat flow. So the big change that we have seen in Australian passive houses as compared to older European ones is that we have much bigger shading elements. A shading is really powerfully controlled because they will overheat if they are not shaded properly. And it's something that back in the 90s, they didn't worry too much about in, in Europe because they didn't have hot summers. Well, that's turned around. And now they're, uh, they're kind of looking at what we're doing and going, oh, okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, we need eaves, we need shading devices and, uh, and, and so on. However, having said that, uh, it is true that every one of our passive houses has what I call minuscule air conditioning systems. Um, I, I call them minuscule because if I say small to the average air conditioning contractor, they go, oh, you mean seven kilowatts? I go, no, mate, no, no, no. Have you got anything in the one and a half kilowatt range? No. So we have this constant argument every time, you know, we usually settle on about two and a half, which is twice what's needed, but that's the smallest air con in the range. So, and why is that there? It, it's just that in, in uh, heat wave conditions to give that resilience to, to suck the heat, the excess heat out of the building. You, you, there, um, if you've got 45 degree days and 35 degree nights, there is nowhere to dump that heat to. And, and so you need a mechanical system to, uh, you know, to pull it out. And, uh, but it, it, and it runs, obviously it's running off the, the rooftop PV. So it's still a net zero house, but but there is that one little proviso that that to to give it the the heat wave resilience, we do use a little aircon system. Yeah, I think I the only thing I would add to that, uh, Dick, is the is is I suppose the the unlearning of the way some people operate a house, and I think that um, that's with a passive house, one needs to uh, have sort of you don't need a degree, but you just need to understand that you know, you're running a highly efficient system and therefore don't just let it, you know, don't leave it open because you think it's a nice afternoon and it's only, you know, 28, 30 degrees when there's going to be a heat wave tomorrow. So it's sort of just a little bit of planning ahead. Um, and, but generally speaking, we find that our home, yeah, we use, um, we've, we recycled the old air conditioning units from the old house and we do occasionally use it when we've been away and we haven't been able to purge overnight or if there's been yeah. heat wave, extensive heat wave, because um, we certainly do have a different climate and we have a bigger diurnal range, but it is definitely applicable and anyone that comes into a passive house or lives in one will never go back. I, I call that the Jeremy Clarkson effect. Um, some years ago in that show that I very rarely watched, he, he was so, this is before EVs, this is hybrids, you know, he was so um, scathing of, of Toyota Priuses that he said, I can make a Toyota Prius use more fuel than a BMW M3. And he proceeded to drive this Prius around a racetrack at 150 kilometres an hour or something. Um, which is not what it was ever designed to do. So he was using the thing stupidly and got a stupid result. Um, so, yeah, understanding how to use the building, how to work with it and, and using it to work with nature will counter the Jeremy Clarkson effect every time. <laughs> Thanks, Dick. Somebody submitted a question about the best way to, what's the best way to ventilate your airtight home? which I think is a great segue into maybe just talking about the, um, the new condensation chapter in your home and what, just the, uh, the fact that with more people getting, becoming more and more aware of the benefits of an airtight home and building them, the, um, the, the accompanying issue of condensation and ventilation that's coming along with it and how that's being managed. Would someone like to 
who knows more than me about it, take over from here? Um, it probably falls to me, does it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, okay. So um, the, what we're moving towards is uh, moving towards the principles that Passive House has recognised for 30 years, uh, and that is that in, in certain situations, it is impossible to stop condensation forming. So it's simply a case of identifying where it will form and then having that outside of the, the materials that would allow it to migrate into the house and cause mould to grow. Mm -hmm. And so, and this is where it is kind of fundamentally different between Hobart, Melbourne and, say, Sydney than it is in Townsville, Darwin and Broome because the, the condensation issues kind of work in reverse, you know, and, and maybe there's an awkward zone in the middle where it could go both ways, but the, nonetheless, the systems will still work. So the, uh, and, and the building code is, has finally recognised recognize this. I mean, it's, it's kind of odd that, that the, uh, the National Construction Code has gone for so many years without addressing this adequately. And uh, so, you know, it's great that it is, but we still will get a better result by you know, adopting the best practice um, according to your construction system. So there's no, you know, I can't, I, I can't sit here and say, you always do this, 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 and this, because it will depend. Are you building in hempcrete? Are you building in light timber frame and, and weatherboards? Are you, you know, like, you, it, what are you building out of? Where are you building? There are so many right. different factors that, that need to be factored in, but, um, you know, without sounding like a broken record, um, it, it's in the book. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Luke, do you have comments about ve ventilating an airtight home? Best way to do it? Well, yeah, certainly. I mean, we, we're using the uh, principles that the passive house do, which is using a, a heat recovery unit. So, uh, and we've used the principles like Dick talked about with the uh, building envelope. So in Melbourne's climate, one would have the most permeable layer on the outside of your stud wall. And then on the inside you saw that during my presentation there's a wrap there that stops the vapor pressure getting into the wall and then to bring fresh air into the house because we've got it so tight each a room has a small little duct that has trickle ventilation that brings in adequate air to ensure that the co2 levels do not rise and in fact it's probably better than most homes that are leaky because they tend to have short circuits and therefore have lots of hot spots for co2 so our house is constantly pressurised and the air is constantly being taken out by this box that sits under the staircase. Someone calls it the magic box, but you know it's called a heat recovery unit, which is running 24 seven, uses 28 watts of power only. But at the same time, it's pretty much like having a window open without losing the heat in winter or getting the heat in summer. So it's, it's a brilliant piece of sort of low tech, high tech. Um, uh, if I say, because it's, it's just a little fan motor, but it's done very well. It, this one's particularly, particularly good, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What he said. Yeah. <laughs> the next question I think is, um, I think it's a lovely question and I, I wish the answer was it's compulsory, um, but I know it's not. How much are builders and architects who design and build off the plan apartments required to look at this guide? When I change when I change my name from Dick Clark to Dictator, <laughs> perhaps this would be a good segue, a good starting point to talk about the um, the training programs that that your home has um, has been the basis for, though, Caitlin. As you were yeah, about I, I was. Um, I think that <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of us would like to establish establish an environmental <laughs> dictatorship, but. <laughs> Um, no, in all seriousness, um, it, what we want to do is inspire um, and sort of be a catalyst for change. And there are um, four training programs that are, that are sort of foundationally based on your home. So the first, I believe, was HIA Green Smart, um, or, or maybe it was the Building Designers one. I don't know, Nick, Dick, you might know, but both of those very early on developed training programs around your home. Um, then there is the Master Builders Association with their Green Living Program. Um, so all of these are continuing professional development programs for 
um, uh, designers and builders in the industry. And then the most recent is the Livability Centre for Real Estate. So we had a question about real estate earlier, um, but that um, program is training real estates to kind of understand what these sustainability features are in a home and why they're important so that they can um, speak to to clients about that and and kind of that that really helps that you know creates that whole ecosystem of demand and education um, and your home also is a foundational reference in um, TAFE and university courses um, so that's really important too so yeah it has had a significant impact in transitioning the industry and yeah we really hope that continues I suppose, yeah, I mean, there, there's a difference between regulation and best practice. And I guess your home is all about best practice. Regulation is about bringing that minimum bar up um, and stopping worst practice from happening. But your home is at the, that other end of the spectrum, which is really about, um, look what's possible. Um, uh, let's take you through the steps and, you know, show you how to do that. Absolutely. Graham, do you have any thoughts on that in relation to bushfires? Um, I think uh, the same principles apply. Um, I mean, clearly a fire resistant home and, and a house that survives a bushfire is also a sustainable home. Um, and I think that's something that people need to keep in mind. So spending a bit of time on really getting those extra principles that are in your home, because there are things in there that are over and above what the minimum standards are. Yeah. Um, things like gutter guards are not required, and yet you could be in a very significant and treed environment where you're getting a lot of materials in your gutters. So rather than having to get up every year and clean it out and spending either the time, money or risk in, uh, in doing that, you could put something in that is acting in a passive way and provides that long-term sustainability. Um, and, of course, that also then protects gutters and the rest of the systems from rusting out and all the rest of it that get, gets associated. So I think the principles that Caitlin's talking about are right. And in terms of training, um, there are a number of training issue areas around, and the Australian Building Codes Board has introduced new training regimes for architects and others to get, um, and, and that includes bushfire. So um, there's certainly plenty of avenues to actually get that training. I think the genius of your home is also that it uh, doesn't only speak to professionals in the industry, but also to the general public, to homeowners. And it's a, it's a really great way for homeowners or prospective homeowners to educate themselves in advance so that they know what questions to ask um, of their designers and their builders and all the professionals that they deal with, with their home renovation, renovations or builds. Yeah, I, sh I should just mention quickly um, that information and communication strategy was a really central part of your home from the very beginning. So um, initially it was based on research with all those intended user groups to kind of say, what, what are your information needs? How do you like to learn? Um, and that sort of then created the, the, the kind of format and informed everything really about what your home would cover what kind of format it would be in. And, and that sort of approach I think has continued that sort of information layering strategy. So no matter what you're looking for, you might want an overview, you might not know much, or you might be a bit of an expert yourself, but you're yeah. just looking for to drill down into the detail that um, all of that is, is possible um, with your home. So that was a really important principle. Yeah. Thank you. So we're just um, probably only got time for one more question to the panel. But before I jump to that question, a very quick one for Angela about images and copy from your home. Can it? Be, what's the what's the story with using with licensing and using of, of images and copy from your home? Can it be used by people on websites and and so forth? Yes. Yes, it can. Yeah. So we have a um, we have a creative commons copyright license uh, which means that um, the the content can be can be used by people and reproduced by people um, however they like uh, so, so long as they attribute it um, and, and we do have um, copyright information on, on our website there's a mm -hmm. copyright button at the bottom of every page 
Um, so it gives examples of how, how to attribute um, correctly. There's only one, there's only one exception, which is um, in situations where there's third, third party ownership. For example, if, if a, a particular photo has been um, taken by a photographer and we've cited that photographer, um, then that, the, the, the um, intellectual property sits with them. But that's described in there. And that's okay. um, the majority of it is, is all Creative Commons um, and able to be used by anyone. Excellent. Okay, final question. What is your one top recommendation for our viewers tonight when they're starting out on a build or a renovation? Nice broad one, who wants to start? I could start with that one, and that is plan carefully. Mm -hmm. Take your time and think through the issues and then try and make sure that you're actually covering all of the issues that actually interact and then inter inter intersperse themselves onto your design. And also be clear in your mind of what you're trying to achieve. I think Luke's comments about timeframes are really important consideration. So what are we doing in the next five years? What are we doing in 15 years? What are we doing? Do we still want to live here when we're retired? And I think planning ahead is a really good thing to do. So that would be my broad picture contribution. Thank you very much, Graham. Well, I'm, I'll go next because pretty much what Graham said. <laughs> on my line, Graham. Um, I think it's sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's just great minds think alike. Um, <laughs> I think it's really important to do your research before you start. Um, so, if you're thinking of starting a renovation or a building project just really thinking through what those opportunities are, reading up. So I would encourage people to like really have, use your home for that because that's what it's intended for, um, to really get a sense of, um, you know, go and look at the, the solar calculators, go and read all about passive design, um, just get a bit of an overview. Um, and then that will really help you make sure that you're actually um, capturing all the opportunities and, um, you know, locking in all the good things. Thanks, Caitlin. Luke, what's your top tip? Oh, top tip. Well, obviously, as before, as everyone else said, but maybe what I'd add to that is the um, aspect where, yeah, when you're looking at things at an overall picture, um, obviously, we're big on on that, and we feel that it's really important to look at those timeframes. But in another way, maybe don't get um, concerned that you can't do it all at once. It's still worth having a master plan. It's yeah. still worth saying, well, I can't do this now, but I don't want to snooker myself down the track. So obviously, if you've done your research, you like these ideas, and you've you've worked out, well, I can just need a little footprint now. Think about how this can be implemented over time and, yeah, how your building and your um, is, is part of the neighbourhood. You know, yeah. what will a neighbourhood look like in the future? You know, we've, you, will the laneway be populated? So should you face both ways? Will, will your front of your house become a, a, a workshop? You know, yeah. how can you make spaces multifunctional? I would say that's a key aspect. This, this ability to adapt uh, builds resilience so that we're not stuck with terrible building stock that has to be pulled down yeah. and started afresh. Thank you, Luke. What about you, Dick? I was going to say uh, run away screaming and have a cold shower. <laughs> um, and really, you know, <laughs> my colleagues and friends have, have pretty much uh, ticked off the list. Um, money is, is always a, a problem for people because everybody really has champagne tastes on a beer budget. Um, so I guess, you know, thinking about how you want your money to be spent, what kind of a legacy you want to leave the world, and, and Luke just touched on this, that the average lifespan of Australian buildings is 42 years, and uh, most buildings seem, to, <laughs> when I look around, um, apart from our, you know, really big ones in the heritage, um, buildings seem to last a lot less than that. Um, and 
that to me is is ridiculous that you know we should be building buildings that have that adaptability to to find new new uses new leases of life as the decades roll by and that are still functional still current in terms of their ecological impact and still loved in terms of their non-temporal aesthetic um you know so did someone say hamptons <laughs> oh no Oh, no, a crisis. <laughs> Let's throw to Angela for the final word. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so my top tip is to engage an energy assessor early. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many people that use the energy rating stage as a, just a tick-off before, before you put your paperwork in for approval. If you get an energy assessor involved early as you're making those design decisions then you don't get to that point where you've you've worked everything out and you've it's, you know you've gone through that emotional journey and you've got it right you've got it just right because then if you go to an energy assessor it's really hard to change it um, but if you're working hand in hand as you're designing with an energy assessor um, and I would recommend a Natas accredited assessor um, as the the ones that can be most uh, clearly verified to be doing quality work. Um, um, you, can, you, you can incorporate uh, things that are cost effective and give you most bang for buck um, in terms of energy efficiency mm. from the outset. Yes, heartily concur. Are you okay, Dick? <laughs> yeah, I'm not allowed to use the H word. The alarm goes off anytime anyone says that around here. <laughs> That's all the questions we have time for tonight, I'm afraid, folks. Uh, before we wind up, I'll quickly hand back to Angela just to announce the lucky winners of the three copies of Your Home that are on offer for those who submitted questions tonight. Yes. Exhibit A, right there. Yes, Exhibit A. So we have um, uh, a soft copy, three copies of the, of the book um, that they have been awarded uh, for three pe to three people who uh, presented, uh, submitted questions early. Uh, so that would be Doug Murchison, Nick Bamford, and Shirley Proctor. We will email you, Doug, Nick, and Shirley, to, um, to arrange delivery. Thank you for your questions, everybody, and thanks very much for coming along tonight. Thank you, and congratulations, you three. Thank you also to our panelists tonight, Angela, Caitlin, Dick, Graham, and Luke for sharing your time and expertise, plus the Your Home team members helping out with questions behind the scenes. And thank you to all of you, our attendees, for tuning in to this Sustainable House Day session. If you haven't already, you can check out all of this year's participating homes and watch recordings of the rest of the Sustainable House Day program, and soon this one as well, at sustainablehouseday.com. And you can explore Your Home online and order your own print copy at yourhome.gov.au. And one final little plug for Sanctuary again. If you'd like to read more about the Your Home story, the upcoming issue of Sanctuary features a great article by Dick and Caitlin on how it all came about. The issue will be available in newsagents from late November or grab a copy from our website, sanctuary.renew.org.au. Thank you again and good night. <laughs>